Hi guys, and welcome to a full drug summary of amino salicylates. Let's get started. So what kinds are there? The main four types are sulfasalazine, mesalazine, balsalazide, and olsalazine sodium. Um, in terms of the structures, let's have a quick look. Sulfasalazine and mesalazine are the most common. Sulfasalazine, if broken down, is broken down into mesalazine, as we see on the left, and sulfapyridine, as we see on the right which will be important for the mechanism of action that we're going to look at in just a second. But just know that mesalazine on the left there is also known as 5-ASA or 5-amino salicylic acid. Um, so we know the structure of sulfasalazine, mesalazine. And I'm just going to tell you that all salazine is two mesalazines together and balsalazide is just another prodrug of mesalazine. Now, let's quickly move on. And it's going to be important when I mention the difference between sulfasalazine and mesalazine with regards to ulcerative colitis versus rheumatoid arthritis. So that is what the amino salicylates are used for. Ulcerative colitis, in particular mesalazine, and rheumatoid arthritis, in particular sulfasalazine. Um, and we're going to discuss why right now. In ulcerative colitis, it's the 5AS, uh, rather the mesalazine, which produces the therapeutic effect. So we can use mesalazine, so i.e. we've got a direct effect, or we can use sulfasalazine, which gets broken down and produces mesalazine anyway. Now, it also produces a sulfapyridine, which in ulcerative colitis has no effect other than potentially causing side effects. <clears throat> um, now, in terms of ulcerative colitis, this mesalazine has immunosuppressive and anti-inflammatory effects the, the exact mechanism of action isn't known it's thought to have a topical action on the colon which is why there's so many different brands which are gastro resistant or prolonged release to try and ensure that they reach the colon to act on that site in particular there's also topical preparations uh, i.e. rectal uh, such as enemas, suppositories and forms to act directly in the areas needed. Now, in terms of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we use sulfasalazine, not mesalazine, or any of the other drugs, because it's the sulfapyridine here that has the mechanism of action rather than the mesalazine. So if we just go back a second, so here we have the sulfasalazine, which we would use in rheumatoid arthritis because it makes that sulfapyridine. We would use mesalazine, however, in ulcerative colitis because that is what we need for the anti-inflammatory and, and immunosuppressive effect. But the sulfasalazine can also be used because it also produces the mesalazine. And the other two, alsalazine and balsalicide, are, from my experience, a lot less common, but do be aware of them. Now, there's no evidence that one brand of mesalazine for ulcerative colitis is better than another, but their release properties may differ slightly as to which areas they are most concentrated in. Now, in terms of side effects, common side effects, as with a lot of drugs, GI discomfort, diarrhea, headaches and dizziness. But the ones you should be aware of are the serious side effects, such as the blood disorders um, and the bone marrow suppression, which would lead to low white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Um, and if any blood disorders, and in particular agranulocytosis, which is dangerously low white blood cells, particularly neutrophils, if any of those are suspected, you'd stop the drug and seek medical attention to get a blood test just to see if everything's okay. Now, what kind of symptoms would you expect with low white blood cells, a sore throat, a fever, an infection? with red blood cells, tiredness, uh, the typical symptoms of anemia, with platelets, increased bleeding or bruising, for example. Now, other notable side effects with sulfasalazine, since we know in terms of the pre-registration exam, they love asking about obscure side effects. Nephrotoxicity, which is where we com we'll come on to monitoring in a second, as well as hypersensitivity reactions. And sulfasalazine-specific reactions, we have yellow slash orange colouring of body fluid, in particular staining of contact lenses, and also reversible um, low sperm count. So as soon as you stop the sulfasalazine, your sperm count will start to come back up. In terms of monitoring, with amino salicylates, the renal function is quite important before starting therapy, at three months, and then annually. However, 
the sulfasalazine monograph suggests that even though the manufacturer recommends it in rheumatic disease, evidence of practical value is unsatisfactory. Now this is just for sulfasalazine in rheumatic disease, but dare I say it, I would recommend that renal function is, just because the manufacturer recommends it, I would say it's worth testing renal function um, with all aminosalicylates in all conditions. But do be aware, sulfasalazine plus rheumatic disease, uh, renal functions, renal function, I beg your pardon, um, practical value may not be uh, ideal. Now, that's in all amino salicylates. However, in terms of sulfasalazine specifically, it is a lot more likely to cause the bone marrow disorders, the blood dyscrasias, as well as liver issues. In which case we would do uh, F FBCs for blood count and LFTs, liver function tests, before therapy and then monthly for three months, and that's where the BNF cuts off. Um, and doesn't suggest any more tests, but keep that in mind, this is what the BNF suggests. In other amino salicylates, not sulfasalazine, we would only do full blood count and liver function tests if adverse effects are suspected. So be aware of that. All amino salicylates, renal function, but be aware of the sulfasalazine exception in rheumatic disease. And in terms of sulfasalazine alone, full blood count and liver function tests are needed for other amino salicylates only if adverse effects are suspected. Now interactions with mesalazine, PPIs can increase gastric pH which makes the stomach less acidic if the pH goes up and therefore this may cause early breakdown of mesalazine which often has a pH sensitive coating to avoid the stomach to try and get as far into the intestines as possible but if you're increasing, um, rather reducing the acidity of the stomach, you can cause early release of that mesalazine, which isn't what you want because you want it concentrated in the colon for ulcerative colitis. Lactulose lowers the stool pH, i.e. makes it more acidic, which may prevent release of the mesalazine tablets with the pH sensitive coating in the colon because obviously they're, they're often um, resistant to acid and they keep on moving and moving and moving until they reach a more alkali area. Now in sulfasalazine, avoid drugs which may cause myelosuppression, so the blood dyscrasias or hepatotoxicity, hence the monitoring we've just covered. So there's a lot of drugs that are in that category right there, be aware of them. And just as an extra point, aspirin is also a salicylate. So if a patient has an aspirin hypersensitivity, they shouldn't take amino salicylates. Thanks very much, guys. We've covered here what uh, the different kinds of amino salicylates, in particular mesalazine and sulfasalazine, and how their structures relate to each other, and also the other two, how their structures relate to mesalazine. Um, we've talked about how mesalazine and sulfasalazine, um, uh, I beg your pardon, I've just said that, how they're related and what indications they are used for. So the ulcerative colitis or rheumatoid arthritis. For ulcerative colitis, mesalazine um, and all the pro drugs used regarding mesalazine rheumatoid arthritis, sulfasalazine because we need the sulfapyridine in there, which all the other amino salicylates do not produce. So we've discussed that mechanism of action. It's unclear, but it does have immunosuppressant effects. Um, in terms of side effects, we've covered common, serious, which is the blood dyscrasias, and notable side effects. We've covered monitoring as per the BNF, um, which is renal function, um, mainly and in sulfasalazine uh, FBCs and LFTs and we've covered the frequencies as well and we've covered the main interactions with mesalazine, uh, sulfasalazine and we've covered um, uh, salicylate hypersensitivity in that if you're intolerant to aspirin or rather, um, beg your pardon, aspirin hypersensitive then you probably should not take amino salicylate either. Thanks for watching guys.